I'm sure you all remember the explosive New York Times article from the end of last year called How Hamas Weaponized Sexual Violence on October 7th. We have a big update now on that story. The New York Times has pulled an episode of its podcast, The Daily, about sexual violence from the October 7th attack on Israel as debates from inside the paper about reporting on the subject heat up. Per The Intercept, the Daily episode had been scheduled for January 9th and was based on that article from Pulitzer Prize winner Jeffrey Gettleman, claiming Hamas had, quote, systematically used sexual violence as a weapon of war. Originally, Gettleman's article was praised in the New York Times halls, but criticism of the piece began to grow internally and externally, leading the Daily producers to pause the episode. Joining us now to weigh in is editor of The Gray Zone, Max Blumenthal, who's been following this very closely and doing much of the firsthand reporting uh, on the original episode and trying to substantiate some of the claims that were made therein. Welcome back, Max. Good to be back. And thanks for hosting me at a more politically difficult, difficult time to take some of these bogus claims down. Well, it is it's a difficult time, as you mentioned, but because a lot of the groundwork that you and Aaron and folks at the Gray Zone uh, have done and Electra and Fatata have done on this, there is more space now to talk about it, apparently so much so that this is being discussed and debated within The New York Times. So tell us, what is the source of the controversy? We, we're the source of the controversy. I mean, they call us critics in The New York Times now, but everybody and their mother and their mother's baby's daddy and the baby's moyle knows that we are responsible for causing this crisis at the New York Times, where New York Times internally is having a freak out over Jeffrey Gettleman and his team's uh, alleged, like I call it alleged reporting, because I don't even know how much reporting they did, accusing, uh, Hamas of using rape as a systematic weapon on October 7th in order to validate the Israeli government's genocidal rampage through the Gaza Strip. Um, and we just had been breaking it down for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then apparently the New York Times wanted to go ahead with this daily kind of video episode in which they were going to report systematic rape as a weapon on October 7th as a fact without including any of the criticism, but other Times staffers, basically the Times rank and file, the journalists were not having it. And they, according to reporting from The Intercept, which also doesn't credit us, just refers to us as critics, which is kind of funny because The Intercept also validated a lot of these lies uh, that we've been debunking. Um, they revealed that it was the New York Times higher ups that were holding on to Gettleman's reportings reporting because of their own ideological proclivities. Um, that, for example, Joel Kahn, and a New York Times board member, had ties to the Israel lobby. But the journalists weren't having it. The facts weren't there. We had debunked many of the witnesses. And then family members of the witnesses, as I'll explain, came out and basically denied Gettleman's reporting. So there was a new article from the New York Times yesterday, UN to study reports yeah. of sexual violence in Israel during October 7th attack, that does repeat um, several of the uh, of the accusations, makes a note of, of some of the testimony from these various people, uh, Sapir being the first name of one of the uh, alleged eyewitnesses, um, some other information from survivors and first responders, et cetera. This article does, I, I think, a better job of um, acknowledging some, as you said, one person disputing how they were characterized initially by the time and some other matters. I guess my question is, is your argument here now at, over the use of the word, I guess, systemic? Um, because I think, as you conceded in our last interview, it is perfectly plausible that there was sexual assault taking place, but that there was something um, a little beyond that alleged in the initial article that it was directed or, or so widespread or something like that. I mean, I'm just going off the evidence, and there is evidence that Hamas militants killed non-combatants on October 7th, shot them, killed them with grenades. There's, there's video evidence of that. 
Right now, there is no evidence of any rape taking place. That doesn't mean I'm going to just deny it. But the, but the claims put forward in this New York Times article, the claims put forward in The Guardian, the claims put, for, put forward by N N NBC, those are what we've been debunking. They don't add up. And so when you talk about this witness, Sapir, who is the Israeli police's key witness, and the Israeli police have acknowledged in an interview with Haaretz, that that witness, that there is no physical or forensic evidence or video evidence or any evidence to back up any of her claims. When this witness claims to have wit been shot in the back, then witnessed uh, gang rape, and then Hamas militants whipping out three decapitated heads of women. And this person can't be fully identified. You have to start questioning some of these claims. I mean, it sounds like something out of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We've seen so many lies, the lies about 40 beheaded babies, the lie about the um, pregnant woman's fetus being cut out, and all of these lies boiling down to some of the same sources, like the so-called rescue organization, Zaka, which as we now know from a Haaretz investigation, was bankrupt on the day of October 7th and is now flush with millions of dollars because of the tall tales and lurid stories that spun out on October 7th, you have to start to question them. And so we put forward these questions and showed inconsistencies in testimony by witness after witness, including Zaka, who Jeffrey Gettleman in the New York Times relied on. And so what Jeffrey Gettleman did is he went back to these witnesses to try to get them to validate his initial reporting, and they couldn't do it. Sapir changed her story again. Roz Cohen, another key witness, refused to speak to him on the grounds that he was traumatized. And the worst and sleaziest thing that Jeffrey Gettleman did is he went to a woman named Mural Alter, who is the sister of one of the key witnesses, Exhibit A. Her name is Gal Abdush, the woman in the black dress who was found killed with burns on her head. And Gettleman just assumed, based on the video, that she had been raped by Hamas. Her own sister had come out and said there was no way she could have been raped said this on Instagram, that the New York Times manipulated them into thinking that the story would be about something else. Her brother-in-law said the same thing in a separate interview with Israeli media. And so Gettleman calls up the sister, Miral Alter, and apparently tries to pressure her into backing down in order to save his own journalistic reputation. So this piece that you mentioned, Robbie, is one of the sleaziest exercises in damage control. It doesn't disprove anything by the so-called critics referring to us and other independent publications like Electronic Intifada and Mondo Weiss or what Brianna has said here. Uh, and I think the scandal continues. Let, let, me, let me raise one other point. So in, in terms of the video evidence, uh, so I, I've seen the, the video footage um, as well. And what I can recall seeing that would perhaps support what is being reported or being described by several of these witnesses that you've described the issues you have with them um, is the uh, some of the female bodies found in states of undress also found with I can recall vividly um, ha a bound hand wrists tied together that sort of thing um, what do you make of that well we have uh, um, Sergeant G who uh, I've actually uh, identified on Twitter. A lot of these Israeli uh, special forces figures, pilots, uh, operate under uh, you know, kind of hidden identities, uh, largely for fear of being prosecuted for war crimes. This guy is uh, in Special Rescue Unit 669 of the Air Force, and he claimed to the New York Times, as he did previously to, I believe, Haaretz and several other publications, that he found two young women in Kibbutzberry who were teenagers in a state of undress with semen on their back. The problem is there were no women found that way. There are official records of how everyone was found. And there, were, there, were no, there was no record. The only pe teenagers or young girls whose ages matched those of the ones described by Sergeant G were the Sharabi sisters who were 13 and 16 and they were found uh, in a state burned so badly that they could only be identified by their teeth and their DNA, and they were found with their mother directly with them. So he lied. This is someone who previously lied because I've been able to unmask him. He previously lied about find, founding a baby uh, thrown in a garbage can. 
And th this speaks to another massive scandal about October 7th that's finally been coming to the surface that Israeli media has been reporting on, but we were out in front of it. And it's, it's an, a scandal that continues to this day. The use of the Hannibal Directive, the only way that these girls and their mother would have been found, or, or the most plausible way, in a home that had collapsed on them in such a badly burned state, is that they were hit by a tank shell or a Hellfire missile fired by an Israeli tank or helicopter. And this happened repeatedly in Kibbutz Berry. It's been documented. At least we, we, we've documented and confirmed that at least 16 Israeli civilians were killed in one home with uh, two tank shell strikes. And this was done in order to kill the captives and the Hamas militants to prevent Hamas from having the political leverage they now enjoy with having over 200 captives. And it continues now in the Gaza Strip, uh, a, a cousin of a hostage in the Gaza Strip, her name is Naomi Dan, has gone on Israel's national broadcaster, Khan News, and accused the Israeli government of enacting the Hannibal Directive to kill the Israeli captives there to prevent a prisoner swap. She said, you're killing our families instead of cutting the deal and having the ceasefire we need. So we've been exposing these scandals from the beginning, and now mainstream Israeli media is beginning to accept that we were actually on to something. We're not just a bunch of conspiracists. And it's only a matter of time before U.S. media is going to have to do this as well. But they're, they're resisting because of the higher ups at places like the New York Times who are ideologically committed to seeing Israel, quote unquote, win. Yeah, I did watch that uh, uh, news interview that you just described with the uh, hostage members, uh, family member, and it was really compelling. It is a remarkable contrast between the kinds of coverage and stories that are aired, even on Israeli TV, which you would think would might be more ideologically opposed to airing that kind of content as opposed to an American uh, in the American media. So just to, to wrap up here, the the posture of this is that the New York Times usually, often, frequently puts out a podcast, daily podcast episode that covers some of its more important reporting. And so you'll read it in the New York Times, and then a day or two later, you'll hear about it on your morning as you're getting dressed, listening to the Daily. In this case, the difference between the coverage that and the, and the Daily after there was this critique from the staffers was going to be so significant from the coverage of the original reporting that it raised some questions about the credibility of the new reporting and whether or not corrections were due. You also alluded to a story in The Guardian that's also gotten some pushback. There was a corroborating, a very similar um, story uh, alleging uh, widespread sexual abuse on October 7th there. And now there are some additional, uh, not just questions about the substance of that reporting, but also plagiarism claims associated with it. Yeah. I mean, Brianna, we're looking at one of the biggest media scandals of our time, where basically one journalist after another at August enlightened liberal publications were led into publishing one fabrication after another by a government that had curated witnesses to present a story in order to justify genocide. I mean, it's unbelievable. So you have the scandal of the caliphate at the New York Times, Rukmini Kalamaki, this self-styled national security reporter and ISIS expert, was basically led into a journalistic disaster by relying on one supposedly former supposedly former ISIS member who turned out to be a fraud and she did this very popular podcast and he made the whole thing up. Here you have a collection of witnesses who are spinning out frauds for not just one journalist but journalists across the media and it appears if you look at the plagiarism in The Guardian by uh, Bethan McKernan who blocked me as soon as I pointed it out, her plagiarism from NBC News that they're both not copying each other, they're copying the Israeli government, which seems to have furnished them a document, and they just sloppily cut, copy and pasted the same document about a uh, witness testimony into their piece, and it's testimony that turns out to be bogus. Then you have Jeffrey Gettleman, who relied on the same witness. I mean, they're all relying on the same witnesses who are furnished to them by the Israeli government, which is just known for its lies, its deceit, its criminality, and now they're caught. Jeffrey Gettleman previously was caught in Zimbabwe fabricating a quote by then leader Robert Mugabe, and it looks like he blamed an anonymous local journalist leading the police on a manhunt for an anonymous journalist, but he had to acknowledge that he made up the quote. 
So there's a long history here. But when you make up stories about official enemies who are hated, like Robert Mugabe, where you know Zimbabwe has faced sanctions for years by the former British colonists in the U.S., and he's portrayed as this evil, dark dictator. Or when you make up stories about Hamas, nobody's supposed to care. You're allowed to lie because of the, uh, the, the, the insidious racism that still pervades liberal culture. And when the lie is about uh, savage Arab barbarian males coming in and raping Jewish women at a music festival, well, that falls on fertile soil even among liberals. Uh, but we could tell at the Gray Zone and at other in independent publications that these were not, these, these, these stories didn't add up and that these were lies that kill because these lies and these fabrications and distortions of half-truths and exaggerations of facts on October 7th are designed to generate political consent for Israel's genocidal assault in Gaza. So they need to be called out and we're going to continue to do it. Max, thank you for all of your independent journalism. And before we go, I just want to say, you know, we get... Yeah. Um, we get a response when you're on. This is a show that features robust debate. So Gettleman or anyone else involved in reporting on this story is welcome on our show. The uh, pro-Israel expert voices are welcome on our show. We would we'd never, even though it was alleged in a recent hit piece on us, we would I would never, ever, ever cancel a guest for their ideological reasons. We on feature us. more diversity of thought on the show than any other new show there is. Uh, so just want that said again for the record. Max Blumenthal, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me.